Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Brilliant, ladies and gentlemen. Do you want to learn things like mathematics, data science, or computer science in an interactive, fun manner at your own pace? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Brilliant is here, providing thousands of lessons, all from those who are in the very basics to those who are trenched in the very advanced topics. New lessons constantly added every single month. And whatever your skill level is, the pace that Brilliant builds for you is specifically set, designed for your speed specific needs. Ladies and gentlemen, as a YouTuber, one of the most important actual aspects for us is understanding data science, how data points interact with each other. But understanding what data points interact with what data points and on how they interact allows me to establish certain trends, allows me to understand how things work. And Brilliant is over there designed to make me enjoy learning without pressing my head up against a brick wall reading a boring little book. Now, if any of this interests you, head on over to Brilliant dot org slash SOG. Remember, you can get started free for 30 days, and if you're the first 200 to go to that URL, then you get 20% off an annual plan. Ladies and gentlemen, go to brilliant.org slash SOG. That said, let's head into the video. Hello, guys and gals, me, Mudahar, and <laughs> you remember the time North Korea's internet got taken down? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, way back in 2022, this magic masterpiece happened. How many geniuses do you think it took to take down an entire country? Well, I'm going to give you some, uh, some guesses, okay? Did it take the entire U.S. cybercoms division? No, 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 no. Did it take a few hackers sitting in a garage? No, 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 no. Did it take one person who ran automated scripts? Absolutely. And if you think, wow, that's crazy, Muda, how did that happen? Well, sit back, relax, because today we're jumping down the story of how North Korea as a whole got DDoS'd. Now, recently there's been some wild shenanigans. This is a VTuber from Taiwan who ended up actually basically showcasing a bunch of confidential information from a Chinese company allegedly known as iSoon. We, apparently there's been like 50 documents and a lot of his details, uh, how this company aims to attack us, all right, how this company is developing malware that can spy on everyone around them. So yeah, the world of cybersecurity constantly evolves and uh, there's always documentation that scares the crap out of me. If that topic interests you, there's a Mastodon account by a user known as Adstill that's just looking through all of the Mandarin translating it piece by piece in order to basically make sense of the situation. But I'm going off on a tangent here. This isn't about the Chinese, this is about North Koreans. And recently, according to the United Nations, North Korea has raked in $3 billion to help it develop its nuclear weapons program. How did it make $3 billion? Was it through hard work? No, 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 no. I mean hard work, technically. But it was through cyber attacks. You know all those scams I've been covering for like the last year, two years? And you know, we've been laughing at some of them. We've been looking at the size and scale. When you add it all up, it's been accounting to somewhere around 40 to 50 cyber attacks that have raked in $3 billion. Whether it be by people in the Lazarus group, so people like this guy who has an actual FBI Most Wanted poster, they'll probably never end up capturing this guy unless he does something really stupid. Why? Because we're talking about a state hacker, people with actual backing from the state itself. Once this guy escapes into China or North Korea, extraditing him, getting him on U.S. soil and arresting him for his actual crimes is usually a near impossibility. But hey, I guess the law enforcement agencies can be fucking hopeful. So yeah, they're investigating 58 suspected DPRK cyber attacks on crypto companies between 2017 and 2023, valued at approximately $3 billion, which they apparently believe, and they allege, finances the development of their weapons of mass destruction. So again, to understand, we're going to go back to 2022. Now, again, based on all this, you think that North Korea is filled with some watchdog tier hackers. And uh, to understand, it's not as glamorous as a video game or a Hollywood movie. In reality, they've always tried to hack people, but it's not as if their country necessarily has the money or the ability to keep themselves as updated as, say, most of the first world or really any country that isn't in the situation that North Korea is in. It's truly a fascinating part of the world. The one section where the closest some people can get to it is literally literally through a website that they've made. Most people will never even get close to it. Most people, even if they try to fly to North Korea, probably may not get in. It's that isolated and it's that kept in the dark. It's a country with 20 plus million people living within it who 
at least for a majority of them, probably don't really have a clue about anything outside of the scope of their country. And they live with so much propaganda that they have to pretty much sit down and believe that their, uh, their, their leader is actually God King born on the top of a mountain under severe divine circumstances. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Back in 2021, there was a few messages going around to people who were actually cybersecurity researchers, right? So this is an account known as at iHackBanMe. This is a mobile and security researcher, and of course, they're a founder of an entire organization. They ended up receiving a message from Zangu, at Z0X55G. So the name is already a little questionable, but they say they're a web developer, they're a browser, hashtag bug, hashtag hunter. So he sent a message saying, hey, what's up? And then of course, Zach responds, hello. Why do I feel like I'm on To Catch a Predator when I, when I read this shit, okay? Thanks for your reply. I have some questions. Please go ahead. I'm interested in researching Windows and Chrome vulnerability. Do you research vulnerability? Uh, dog, it's in their bio. I guess they probably do. <laughs> and he wasn't the only person that was treated this way. There were other users like Richard Johnson, Warning, I can confirm this is true. I got hit by Z0X55G, who sent me a Windows kernel POC trigger. The vulnerability was real and complex to trigger. Fortunately, I only ran it in a virtual machine. In the end, the VMDK I was using was actually corrupted and non-bootable. So it self-imploded. It didn't explode, okay? It just, it just got corrupted. Let's not try to hype this up, okay? Let's not hype beast of VM breaking. It's not that exciting. So to give you an idea what was actually happening for anybody that's not picking it up, uh, North Korea was fishing for vulnerabilities. They were literally trying to Tom Sawyer their way through. They were like, hey, can, can, can we collab with you? Maybe you can give us, you know, something. Maybe we can work together. In reality, they were trying to get actual vulnerabilities that they could use against those cryptocurrency companies, really any hack they were going for. Over the past several months, and this comes from Google's Threat Analysis Group, the Threat Analysis Group has identified an ongoing campaign targeting security researchers working on vulnerability research and development at different companies and organizations. The actors behind this campaign, which we attribute to a government-backed entity based in North Korea, have employed a number of means to target researchers. So they would basically make these random accounts like Zangu, James Wiley, Brownsec Laboratories, and Billy Brown. So the most random ratchet names you could imagine. And also you could probably identify that they most likely maybe followed each other. Uh, these were just accounts that were made to look like cybersecurity officers. And they would, you know, communicate with real actual researchers. And what they would do was they would link to their blog. So at the time, they were actually showcasing exploits just to give proof that they were real hackers. But again, nobody could verify if any of their stuff was working, some of their YouTube videos that they were showcasing. But what they were doing was they were sending out these actual blogs, right? And in these blogs, one of the links ended up being blog at br0vvnn.il. And again, if you're wondering what that leads to, I'm gonna just reload this page. I'm gonna show you exactly where this goes to. Uh, it, it can't be reached. It's been gone for like years. Usually when you have hackers, they keep the site up for like as long as the hack is active and then it's just gone. And if we way back machine this through, I wanna say the good old fashioned, you know, just a sandbox browser, which ladies and gentlemen, every time you go to these websites, always, and I mean always for the love of God, run this through an actual sandbox browser. The only reason I recommend it is even under virtual machines, unless you want things to start getting really corrupted, don't bother doing this. But again, looking through actually what is the Wayback Machine, I think we have a hit. It's going to something known as home. So I hope it loads within the two minutes that I have allotted for this VM. <laughs> oh, look at that. Introduce us to a system and we will prove that it's vulnerable with enough time. Nothing is unhackable. So yeah, this is their actual website. This is what a North Korean like Creator made 2020 all rights reserved. They even have a Gmail address, everything part of this situation. So yeah, they were not kidding around. They tried to make themselves look as legitimate as they possibly could. And now look at the end of it, what they would do is they would try to make themselves look as legitimate as they could. But in the end of the day, what they would do is they would basically, according to like Google here, they would give people a visual studio project and that would be the source code for exploiting the vulnerability. And they would give an additional DLL that would be executed through Visual Studio build events. And that DLL was the custom malware that would immediately been communicating with their C2 servers. We looked at malformed DLLs in the past and we looked at how this works. 
but generally that's how they would actually infect people. And when they infected the actual security researchers, the goal, again, was to get access to their exploits that they were researching. So again, through this guise of collaboration, they would get access to un, you know, unidentified exploits to them. And they could just start amassing and amassing as many as they could that they could you know, use against big targets. Now to give you an idea, the value of these is insane. Zero days, for anybody that doesn't know, is basically an unidentified attack, an unidentified bug. So for instance, zero days could exist right now in some of the most popular devices that you use. For instance, if you're using an iPhone, right? Like any device, any modern smartphone, whether it be the most updated Android, whether it be the most updated iOS, or you could be using the most updated browser, something as recent as, you know, whatever the updated version of Brave, Chrome, Firefox, Edge is. And there could be a chance that there is a vulnerability in those versions somewhere sitting around. Now, obviously, if you have an unused device, something that's not so popular, uh, chances are zero days will probably exist in that and there'll be zero days because nobody really has an interest in that piece of hardware or software. They don't really care about looking in the nitty gritty and there's just not a lot of attacks that you could perform, not a lot of vulnerable targets, right? But if you use something like Google Chrome, for instance, having a zero day within Google Chrome or having a zero day within Apple's iOS is very valuable. We're talking millions of dollars of value right there. Because any, any group that's going to get access to that zero day, and if they're smart, they can actually attack a whole litany of individuals for months, if not years, without being detected. Now, obviously the zero days cost that much because of the potential market that you can attack, but also because you're going up against big companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, you name it, that have specific divisions, people they consult with, bug bounties to help constantly fight against this. When Apple gives you $10,000, to report a bug, report a zero day, that's 10,000 bucks, that's pennies for them, faced with the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in damages they could go through if suddenly their actual user base was, you know, leaked out for the world to get, especially when they sell themselves on things like privacy and whatnot. So that's generally what North Korea was going for. And of course, most of these hackers kind of laughed it off, the accounts got suspended, but there was one person one person who didn't appreciate this shit at all. Now, a Wired article ended up coming out in 2022 by a writer known as Andy Greenberg, who actually talked with an individual known as P4X. Now, I tried finding out who P4X is, but I don't think this person really has any company or anything or most social media, unfortunately, at least from what I've been able to see. And if they have had social media, I don't think it's necessarily uh, necessarily available, necessarily like the same. Maybe it's a pseudonym they used for this specific like thing. So after a year of being communicated by these scumbags, he kind of waited a little bit and realized, no, this isn't how it happens. So P4X is an American cybersecurity researcher who decided to use their expertise and attack North Korea's rather ancient, and I mean ancient systems. So this led me down another little rabbit hole into wondering how a country gets access to the internet. Now, North Korea is pretty much a new uh, contender in the world of online internet access. Whereas a lot of countries, you know, we live in North America, our countries have been on the internet since its initial inception. But a country like North Korea has basically started to use the internet post 2014, quite specifically. Looking at the actual history for them, North Korea at one point quite literally only operated through the benefit of the Chinese government. Back in 2010, North Korea basically started slipping into the internet through German satellite access. And for a while, when they started to really enter the internet, they had somewhere around a thousand something IP addresses allocated in the entire country. To give you context here, our countries, specifically the United States, had over 1.5 billion IP addresses at the time that you know companies or uh, publications like CNN were reporting this stuff. So to give you an idea, when they were accessing the internet post Germany, they were working closely with the Chinese government and basically piggybacking off of them for internet access to the rest of the world. And a lot of it was meant primarily for government access. So for government officials to contact government officials for another country, for instance. It wasn't until the general country started to have proper internet the way that we normally use 
throughout the rest of the country. However, obviously, there people can't access, you know, Google, YouTube, a lot. There's still a firewall in, in, in effect for people in the country, so they can't just escape and see the world outside. So after the Chinese gave them a little bit of access, what had happened later was a company known as Star Joint Venture Company, and the Star Joint Venture worked alongside a company known as the Loxley Pacific from Thailand and basically created what is the, the actual internet of North Korea that we know of today. So what they said was control of North Korea's top level domain has been formally assigned to a government backed venture after a previous operator, a German company, let the national domain disappear from the internet for several months. Now I assume there's two sides to every story. I just think checks weren't getting, I think checks were being bounced at some point. But anyways, what had happened over here was the .kp domain was officially transferred to Star Joint Venture, which is a North Korean Thai company that has been charted with providing modern internet services to their country. Now, for anybody that doesn't know how this stuff works, there's a great write-up by the lads over at Cloudflare. So to give you an idea, a top-level domain, a TLD, and in specific, a country code TLD, these are reserved for use by countries, sovereign states, territories. So you know when you go to a website and you have to type in .ca for Canada, .au for Australia, .uk for uh, you know, the United Kingdom, I think it's .il for Israel, uh, you have to put in .kp for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, also known as North Korea. And of course, this is all done through an actual board known as ICANN, who basically are people that don't control the internet, but they are coordinating the internet naming system that we know and use today. And one of the branches that belongs to ICANN, IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, gave the delegation record of the KP to Star Joint Venture Company. And that's how North Korea got access to their own actual top level domain. Now, because of this top level domain, there's actually been websites that you too can access right now if you want to explore North Korean internet in its like, you know, prime. So for instance, aircoreo.com.kp is literally the only actual uh, airline company in all of North Korea, and you can access it right now on their own website. And again, they've given out their numbers, which I'm blurring out, no need to emergency call them. Their headquarters are all over in headquarter, Beijing, Shenyang, Shen Shanghai, Dandong, Moscow, Vladivostok, Berlin, and Kuwait. And again, I assume there's view more, but I'm not really that interested. What is interesting is, damn, these prices from Vladivostok to Pyongyang, $229. That's not as pricey as I think it is, god damn. And you've also got the cooking website. This is cooks.org.kp. So if you wanted to learn about North Korean food, you can, and some of this food looks like a banger. I don't know what the hell this is supposed to be. I'll tell you what right now, that looks like, that looks like a straight up banger right there. Look at that, dude, god damn. The presentation is beautiful. I bet that came right out of Kim Jong-un's place. Uh, what is that? Oh, that looks like, that looks like ass. And of course, if you want to see a celebration propaganda, you can look at the brilliant commander of Peck 2. But this isn't a propaganda video. That's not what I'm here for. Anyways, North Korea moves into the internet, but obviously it's not a country, like I said, that really has access to some of the most crazy technology and updated practices when it comes to the internet. In fact, of course, if you looked into their DNS, you would realize that these websites are few and far between. I think it's something around 30 to 40 websites, maybe 50 max that exist in North Korea. In general, the internet is very tight-fisted. And unless you're part of the elite few in the country, your exterior facing access, so you can see things like YouTube, is very far and few between. In general, most people have access to a very controlled version of the internet. And of course, that control comes with a whole litany of surveillance. Now, what's really funny over here is P4X, this wasn't even the craziest attack. Going back over there, what they had apparently said in their interview with Wired was they had targeted unpatched vulnerabilities in North Korean systems that allowed him to launch DOS attacks. So DDoS, denial of service, which basically means that you are constantly requesting access information from a server to the point that it eventually caves in amongst itself, okay? Basically, it's overloading in general sense, an entire server with so many requests, 
so many responses that eventually it just basically caves in. It stops working for a little bit. It crashes down. So the country, and again, because their internet wasn't so massive, they had like, what, 30, 40 websites even at the time, shutting down these areas wasn't that difficult. But again, one of the most important parts, and again, I highlighted this for you, was they found bugs in their web server software. So software such as NGINX, and of course, you also had ancient versions of Apache. So these two pieces of software are software that power a lot of websites and frameworks and servers on the internet. And if you are somebody on the internet, you probably wanna keep these things as updated and secure as you can. Vulnerabilities exist all the time. And if you leave software that is un -up that is like basically left dormant for 10 years without an update, there's a good chance that a toddler might get in might might develop enough intelligence to attack you <laughs> attack your server. And again, they even started to look into their own operating system known as Red Star OS, which according to P4X, he described as an old and vulnerable version of Lunix. And I agree, I actually browsed Red Star OS on my channel. And I can tell you right now, it is basically a butt fucking of Linux, an old version of, I believe, Debian. And they basically like had a UI that they put on that resembled like old school Mac OS X, like Snow Leopard or whatever, right? Like Mountain Lion, old school Mac OS X, not even new old school mass, ma, ma, Mac OS X. Now, of course, since then, Red Star has went through some updates. So they have Red Star 4.0. I don't know who they're aping. Maybe it's still Mac. Maybe they're aping Windows or something, or maybe they're just using borderline like KDE Plasma. I'm not entirely sure. But yes, they use their own operating system, which is, of course, a Linux-based operating system. And this shouldn't really surprise anybody. Linux is used by tons of people around the world, tons of companies, organizations, governments, because as you can imagine, a lot of governments probably don't wanna just specifically use closed source software, software that ultimately belongs to Microsoft or Apple when they can put something together that they can control entirely on their own. It's one of the reasons why I use Linux as well. I built my computer, I like to also own my software. That's kind of how it works. So according to P4X, they even automated their attacks on their systems. Basically, they would just run some scripts, walk away from their computer. So this guy was able to run a script, fuck off, and as they were doing their own thing, maybe they went out for a nice cup of coffee. Their American computer was destroying the backbone infrastructure of North Korea's entire country. Again, one person. One person, by the way, <laughs> insanity. And at the time, people who were covering this had thought maybe the country was being taken down by a group of hackers. Remember, at this moment in time in North Korea, there were actually like missile tests at the time going on. And some people thought maybe this was just a group trying to like, you know, again, fight against him for some political objective. But in reality, he wanted to do this again because he felt that this was right. There's no reason why a country like North Korea should be able to harass and try to steal exploits from hardworking researchers. And I 1000% agree. But yeah, the story of how North Korea got taken down by one person running some scripts on the most ancient we're talking servers with dusty hieroglyphics written on them, was a little fun moment in time. Now, obviously, could this happen again? I'm sure after that moment, North Korea probably got legitimately embarrassed, but obviously with how important the internet infrastructure and the cyber attacks have become for them, I don't think that this is ever gonna be something that happens again. You know, fool me once, you know, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And I think North Korea takes that pretty much to heart. So yeah, is this gonna be a one and done type thing? Maybe so. But again, the world of cybersecurity is wild indeed. Who knows if this gets happening again? Who knows if they get taken down one more time? But yeah, North Korea, it's always fun to watch their government take a massive L. And hopefully one day the people under their country's subjugation can one day in my lifetime have a massive W. That said, ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar. And if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.